예, 안녕하세요. 저는 오늘 좌장을 맡게 된 한화 자산운용의 솔루션 사업 본부 차덕영 본부장입니다. 오늘 이렇게 만나 뵙게 돼서 반갑습니다. 오늘 사회자분께서 말씀해 주신 것처럼 엔비디아 주식을 토큰화하다 비정형 자산 토큰화의 정석이라는 주제로 좌측에 계신 세 분의 전문가 분들하고 토론을 진행할 텐데요. 어, 토론을 진행하기에 앞서서 어, 패널 세 분에 대해서 간략하게 소개를 드리도록 하겠습니다. 제 옆에 계시는 분부터 차례대, 차례대로 소개를 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 캐나다의 근거지를 둔 토큰 발행 및 유통사인 INX에서 바이스 프레지던트를 맡고 계신 밥 에조담이시고요. 다음은 스위스의 근거지를 둔 토큰 발행사인 팩트 파이낸스에서 어, 사업 개발 헤드를 맡고 계신 방금 프리젠테이션을 끝내신 어, 벌나도 퀸타오이십니다. 그리고 마지막으로는 엘살바도르의 근거지를 둔 토큰 발행과 유통 어, 사인 이너 증권에서 CEO를 맡고 계신 로드리고 멘데스이십니다. 어, 세 분께 환영의 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. 어, 이세 분의 회사는 최근에 파트너십을 체결을 했는데요. 어, 올해 7월에 백트 파이낸스와 INX가 파트너십을 체결을 했고 올해 8월 그러니까 이번 달이죠 이번 달에 백트 파이낸스와 이너증권이 또 다른 파트너십을 체결을 했습니다 그 파트너십의 협업 구조가 상당히 유사한데요 백트 파이낸스가 발행사로서 그 엔비디아 같은 그런 주식을 토큰으로 발행을 하고 그리고 INX와 이너증권에서는 그 발행된 주식 코인을 자체 거래소에 상장을 해서 유통을 시키는 그런 구조입니다. 그래서 오늘 주제인 주식 토큰화 관련해서 어, 경험과 인사이트를 공유해 주실 수 있는 가장 적합한 패널이 아닐까 생각을 합니다. 자 그러면 은 소개를 마치고 토론을 시작할 텐데요. 먼저 어, 버나도 퀸타오께 질문을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 현재 백트 파이낸스가 이 시장에 발행된 주식 토큰 이 시장에서 점유율이 90% 이상을 차지하고 있습니다. 즉 대부분의 주식 토큰이 지금 어, 백트 파이낸스를 통해서 발행이 되고 있는데요. 어, 이 백트 파이낸스에서 보시는 주식 토큰의 장점 그리고 시장 전망에 대해서 간략하게 말씀을 해주시고 그리고 백트 파이낸스가 이렇게 큰 마켓 쉐어를 갖게 된 강점에 대해서 간략하게 설명해 주시면 감사드리겠습니다. Great, thanks for the question. Um, I think uh, we are definitely very solid on our regulatory and compliance approach. As I said, as I shared in my previous um, presentation here, um, we worked a lot for a couple of years to understand Uh, what is the best jurisdiction uh, for an uh, issuer to be at? And we found out uh, that for us, um, on the, the way that we want to, to do business, that, that we are doing business, um, Switzerland and later the Jersey Islands are very um, solid and, and a very um, good framework to work with. It doesn't mean that it's easy. Uh, we do have a lot of compliance and um, regulatory requirements that are challenging and at some points very uh, tiring even to, to work with. Um, but on the, on the other hand, um, I guess uh, that make our tokens um, to have the best from the crypto world where we have, you know, the instant settlement, um, connectivity, interoperability, composability with other protocols and other players, um, but also the best from the traditional capital markets where we have um, the robustness of the Swiss banking system and the Swiss uh, players and, and friendly uh, regulation. Um, to guarantee uh, that these tokens are actually um, the best form of delivering um, investors' protection to, to investors. Um, if you go to the detail of it, 
Um, they are not um, as many other STO tokens around the market um, that are mainly DAPT instruments um, that are IOUs or some kind of promises um, to investors. Um, on our on our hand, on, on our side, we actually deliver um, traditional finance uh, instruments um, that are actually um, ownership against uh, the collaterals that are held on on the banks and, and on the traditional custody. Um, that's um, I think that's our um, um, you know strength um, on, on that sense. Uh, we're very good to navigate uh, the regulatory framework to to guarantee um, the robustness and the safeness for um, our uh, investors so that there is very minimum risk added from holding a traditional stock versus holding a tokenized stock. Um, our goal in this sense is that there is no significant risk um, to hold either of them. And then, of course, there are benefits of holding uh, digital stocks that, um, to be very honest, very transparent, are not really clear yet, are not really here yet in the market, uh, but we are building it, right? Like partnerships uh, with players like INX and Inor are actually you know, pioneering in the market, um, so, so we can talk, about, talk more about it um, in this panel, but um, I think from, from our perspective, that's our strength. 네, 답변 감사합니다. 어, 다음은 밥과 라드리고, 라드리고께, 라드리고께 질문을 드리고 싶은데요. 어, INX하고 인오어 모두 백트 파이낸스하고 협업을 지금 진행을 하고 어, 주식의 주식 토큰의 유통을 시작했거나 아니면 이제 계획 곧 계획을 하고 계신데요. 이러한 협업을 진행하면서 느끼셨던 점을 공유해 주시면 좋겠고 특히 이런 준비 과정에서 혹시 기술적이거나 혹은 법적인 어려움은 없으셨는지 만약에 있었다면 어떻게 해결을 하셨는지 공유해 주시면 감사드리겠습니다. Hello. Uh, good morning everyone. Uh, well, uh, Inner Securities was founded since of the beginning to be a permissioned uh, investment exchange. So we, our focus was always to develop a company you know, to, to be able to offer this, those kind of elements, so th those kinds of assets. Uh, of course, uh, we faced a lot of uh, challenge uh, during the process to to make this this all all the all these possibilities happen uh, in, inserted into the new regulatory framework at El Salvador, because uh, at this point we are talking about a token an STO that is not issued inside El Salvador; it's it's issued outside El Salvador. So uh, we we need to. At the past, we need to did some amendment with the regulator, uh, where uh, our company is kind of responsible for uh, everything. Uh, uh, everything that it's it's it happens or it can happens with that token that we are onboarding in our company from outside the. El Salvador. So this is, was the main challenge that we faced uh, to onboard uh, Beckett uh, and other that we started, but this opened a huge door right now that we can onboard uh, any kind of other assets uh, in uh, countries that have uh, jurisdiction that already have in place their STO uh, regulatory framework and El Salvador recognized as a security or digital asset. So this is was the main challenge that, and this is how we face it. 
네, 감사합니다. 다음은 밥께서 네, 답변 부탁드리겠습니다. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, we started working with BACT. Uh, I think it was in September of last year or so. And um, as 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 you all know, INX is a regulation first uh, um, approach. Is is what is what we take. We uh, are registered with the United States SEC. We have a license to trade, to list and trade security tokens. So we're not going to uh, put any of these licenses at risk by listing assets that are non-compliant. And so the first stage of the relationship with BAC really was a lot of due diligence, uh, a lot of uh, legal opinions, a lot of uh, compliance checklists, uh, collaborating with uh, with BACT, looking at interpreting the, e the way these, uh, the assets are being created under EU regulations and how they fit in with the INX ATS. Um, we run through certain criteria of evaluations when we look at listing an asset on the INX platform, and these will uh, uh, typically be based on the local jurisdiction under which the security itself is being created. So it means our team has to understand the Swiss DLT Act, the European uh, uh, blockchain laws, and so on. Um, in addition to the lengthy compliance uh, process, there is also the technology side of things, probably not as complex, but still important to identify things like what blockchain are we going to support the token on? So as Bernardo showed in his slide deck a few minutes ago, they're issuing these securities on multiple chains, and so it becomes really a choice that INX has to make in collaboration with BACT to say, if we bring out, uh, uh, when we list NVIDIA, are we going to do it on Ethereum or any one of the other chains that, uh, that is available? In the case of NVIDIA, we went with Ethereum, uh, it's a chain that we have a lot of experience uh, issuing tokens or listing tokens on, but it's not the only chain that INX supports. We, we are multi-chain uh, and want to be chain agnostic as more and more assets are deployed on various blockchains. So uh, it is very likely that the next set of assets that we will list in collaboration with BACT may actually not be on Ethereum. They may be on any one of the other chains uh, like Avalanche or Polygon. So decisions will be made there soon. Um, all in all, it was uh, a really positive experience, specifically Bernardo and I collaborating uh, and driving this on behalf of both companies. You know, we went through this sort of traditional ways of uh, collaborating. We had working documents, shared drives, where we would, you know, kind of go through, through all the various questions and answers and supporting each other. So it was a really pleasurable experience. And uh, as Bernardo said, this is the early days, right? So we are breaking new ground, making these assets available, as I said yesterday, to people in countries that just do not have access to NASDAQ listed stocks, right? So the people in many of the various emerging economies, um, they know of these global brands. They know of the power of NVIDIA. We all know how attractive NVIDIA is. Uh, and has been in these last uh, uh, in this last few years, and it's almost like a, a human right to be able to acquire Nvidia and add it to your portfolio. And so, if you imagine people being aware of the value of these companies and the role that they're going to play in the future, specifically this AI uh, uh, future that we're heading into, why should why should people in Nigeria or in Indonesia or Kenya? Uh, or Argentina be, you know, have such challenges in acquiring these stocks. And if we can find a way to bridge this gap and put the, the tokenized version of the stock in the hands of these people, then it's a very noble uh, accomplishment and something we're really proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the process of the compliance process of 혹은 어떤 체인 플랫폼을 사용할 것인지 이런 부분에 대한 검토가 매우 중요하다고 말씀을 주셨고요. 그리고 방금 이제 주식 토큰화에 대한 어떤 강점 측면을 설명해 주셨는데 이거와 연관돼서 하나 질문을 좀 드리고자 합니다. 
세 분께 공통으로 드리는 질문이고요. 준비되시는 분 먼저 자유롭게 답변을 주시면 될것 같습니다. 이 자산 토큰화라는 것이 기본적으로 어, 갖는 가장 큰 장점 중에 하나가 소액 투자자들, 기존에 소외되어 있던 소액 투자자들이 어, 자산에 대한 접근성을 가질 수 있도록 돕는 측면이 아닐까 생각을 합니다. 예를 들어서 부동산이나 예술 작품 같은 가격이 높아서 투자하기가 좀 어려운 그런 자산들을 잘게 조각조각 쪼개서 그 부분들을 소액으로 투자할 수 있게 함으로써 이런 개인 투자자들, 소액을 가진 투자자들이 어떤 이 액세스를 그 자산에 좀 가져갈 수 있게 그렇게 도와주는 측면이 정말 큰 장점 중에 하나가 아닐까 생각을 하는데요. 반면에 오늘 주제인 이 주식을 토큰화하는 부분에 있어서는 이러한 장점이 크지 않을 것 같이 생각이 됩니다. 왜냐하면 주식이라는 건 이미 기업의 가치를 잘게 쪼개서 전통적인 거래소에 상장을 시켜 놓았기 때문에 이미 지금의 형태로도 충분히 그러한 유동성은 확보할 수 있다고 보여지거든요. 네, 이러한 측면에서 그럼에도 불구하고 이 주식 토큰화 시장이 향후에 더 커질 수 있다고 보는 이유가 궁금하고요. 또 하나는 기존의 전통적인 주식 거래 시장과 어, 이 토큰 형태의 주식 거래소가 미래에 어떠한 형태로 공존하게 될지 그 방향성에 대해서 좀 질문을 드리고자 합니다. 준비되시는 분부터 먼저 답변 주시면 감사하겠습니다. I think I can start on the first question, and you, you guys can compliment me. Um, I see mm, the advantages of tokenizing um, exotic illiquid assets and the ability to fractionalize being interesting, um, but I also think it's hard, um, more challenging to create these niches online. Um, I think it's a whole um, different um, perspective on using um, blockchain as infrastructure. Um, for us, the decision to go after very liquid assets like treasury bills and stocks and yeah, other ETFs and so on um, is because the demand came for that first with the crypto native players, with DAOs, with crypto investors, with foundations. Um, there was latent in the market that um, people were um, you know, willing to, instead of holding stable coins that are not generating yields, holding other assets that are generating yield from the traditional finance um, markets. Um, so I think that was our first um, criteria. We were really listening to market demand. And I think it's um, easier for um, showing to a crypto investor that is already familiar with NVIDIA and may even hold NVIDIA in his traditional stock brokerage or if he has this challenge of accessing um, if he's from a, you know emerging market or um, yeah, a country that isn't has a lot of capital controls and things like that. Um, if it's harder for him to access uh, US stocks as Bob was sharing, um, then it makes a lot of sense. There's the access or the accessibility uh, aspect of the benefit, uh, but also there's the blockchain uh, infrastructure benefit, um, the settlement being instant, um, the transparency um, being there by you know open source um, data. Um, there's um, the risk management aspect of holding uh, assets um, that are able to be collateralized um, and, and that you can um, you know, use your, or, or, or manage your whole portfolio uh, on chain. Um, there is clearly the advantage and if, if you don't need to off-ramp pay taxes or pay fees and then wait for your bank wire to confirm to then buy a stock or a TBU off-chain and then if you want to go back to crypto you need to you know on-ramp again transfer to a 
OTC desk or to a exchange and then you know wait for another wire transfer and your bank may be asking why are you doing this where is this money going to and etc we've all been there in the crypto space um, so my my perspective um, is that um, soon we will not be you know making the differentiation if a security um, is a token or is a digital is a tokenized security because blockchain will be the base infrastructure for the whole capital markets it, it just makes sense to have um, an, an internet native infrastructure um, that is more modern that is uh, more transparent and and uh, faster than having the old capital market infrastructure that was built in the 70s, you know, in, in the 80s, and that is not internet-based, right? That, 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 that just makes sense. And in that sense, I will start to reply <laughs> on the second question, because I think traditional exchanges need to be blockchain-based, or the new ones will just replace them. As new banks and startups are, you know, mostly replacing uh, traditional companies. I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think, first of all, the human story is one of constant evolution, right? Whether uh, technological evolution characterizes a, you know, a huge part of the human story in these last, you know, 100 years or so. So one way or the other, there will be technical evolutions in everything we do. And in the case of financial markets, one of those is going to be blockchain. It's, it's already there, it's already here, it's already being adopted in various ways, um, ways that are either going to be very prominent and ways that will be characterized through new products or new uh, uh, blockchain-powered versions of existing products, or also characterized in ways that we will never realize. Blockchain will sit silently behind the scenes and, and facilitate many, many processes. Um, you know, from, from if we look at this natural evolution, one of the exciting things that has come out of blockchain and crypto in these last few years is DeFi, a much more efficient way of doing certain financial transactions like lending and borrowing. Today, not every broker will allow you or will have a, a, a way for you to borrow against your stocks. So you could have an entire portfolio of shares, um, but not every broker will have an, uh, a setup where you can say, hey, I would like to borrow against, you know, borrow some dollars or some fiat against my stock holdings. Uh, if DeFi protocols start to accept tokenized equities as collateral, and in a, you know, from my bedroom on my phone, I can actually take my, my stocks, my tokenized stocks that I self-custody and instantly borrow stablecoin in a few minutes while you know lying in my bed. This is evolution, right? This is uh, this is a way of of um, utilizing my stock holdings in such an efficient manner that is just not available today. Um, another another uh, when we look at natural evolution, the fact that many people never own stocks and still don't own stocks, but they will talk about their investment portfolios and their crypto and, you know, their entire investment portfolios are crypto assets. Um, Bitcoin in, in good cases and in bad cases, just meme coins. But they're adopting the language, they're talking about dollar cost averaging, they're talking about, uh, they're using trading language, trading terminology, and, um, and as I shared in a slide yesterday, we're seeing entire changes in the demographics of, of investors. We're seeing much younger investors, and we're also seeing a lot of emerging markets, you know, adopting crypto in, in, in at very fast rates. So bringing an asset like tokenized equities uh, to the market like BACT has done, and then listing it on a platform like, like INX, isn't just a slightly marginal increase or improvement in choice or, or availability or variety of investment 
opportunities. I think it's huge. I think it's a seismic shift in how uh, people are accessing these assets, and all of this is powered by, by the blockchain and, and the various uh, improvements that are coming from this. So it's it, and then lastly, in terms of existing exchanges and, and, and these upcoming platforms like ourselves, we were just discussing yesterday with a gentleman from Bloomberg, um, if you think about all these NASDAQ-traded stocks, they're being traded actively while Asia is asleep. Um, so being able to suddenly have price discovery while uh, the U.S. markets are shut and Asia is actually awake and to say, what is the price of NVIDIA right now? Like, you know, the, the NASDAQ is closed, but where should we price this at? You know, there's all kinds of asset managers, investors that are constantly running the numbers, right, on their portfolios, on their risk and so on. And if you take this to a next level with INX, for example, being able to trade these assets on the weekend, why wouldn't you want to have price discovery of, of NVIDIA on a Saturday or on a Sunday? Um, this could be hugely beneficial. So the more we get volume trading and we have uh, a market and, and on, on the platform on the weekends, the more the traditional platforms and players will start to want to consume this market data and help in their, in their models and their... Uh, their data and, and price discovery. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Uh, Rodrigo, I'm really sorry, but we are running out of time, so I think I can give you just one minute. <laughs> no, that's okay. I can tell you just, I agree, totally agree <laughs> with the two guys. And just to give a message about the, the, the moment that we, we are facing right now is the what I do believe that is the disruption. You know, 20 years ago, 10 years, 12 years ago, the people were telling that FinTech movement was the disruption. And I totally disagree in some meetings. And because I always told that the disruption time was supposed to happen when the investor has the contact directly with the fundraiser or the the, the lender or the whatever. So, and this, this is where we came right now, where we are right now. So defy possibility, things like that. Uh, structures uh, worldwide uh, in blockchain provides this type of uh, opportunity for the investors. And you can never forget that who is pushing that are the investors they are pushing this. They want to leverage their money. They want to improve that. So that's why we are here right now. And uh, about the, the, the coexist of worlds, uh, I, do, I really do believe that uh, uh, now we have a different point. Uh, we have the issuers control and we have distributors all over the road, uh, uh, you know, just distributing the supply controlled by the issuer. Like right now, we have the supply controlled by Beckett being distributed at the same time from us and from INX, so it's the same time. So this is what is gonna happen worldwide. So. Uh, in all exchanges or in all banks, investment banks, is going to be the same. This is how I do believe. What uh, you three are doing, I come from a, a, a microfinancing unbanked world myself, but um, I've got a question. Bob mentioned that um, INX obviously litigious and, and, and looking at what re regulators are looking for within uh, blockchain. And I was wondering, how do you protect the privacy between the buyer and seller on a public blockchain? That's my question. Well, as far as the, the public blockchain is concerned, the only information that is available is the movement of tokens from, from wallet to wallet. Um, so clearly there is no you know, personally, identi 
personal identifiable information in that sense. Um, there are, there are, I can imagine there are scenarios where uh, trades that are happening should not be, you know, signaling, right, should not be available to the entire market for people to be able to see, oh, look, someone has just bought X amount of, of NVIDIA and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, this, is, this is the transparency that the blockchain brings, right? And if there are investors that are highly sensitive to signaling and do not want their trades uh, to be visible or the fact that someone is, you know, a whale is purchasing these assets, then they would choose a different mechanism to, to do the trades. And they wouldn't do it in a, on a, in a way that is visible in that way. And that, and that is no different today. There is a reason dark pools exist for trading certain assets. Um, and there's a reason that, uh, that other trades are disclosed uh, for various reasons. Yes. Uh 상당히 인사이트가 있었던 답변들인 것 같고요. 그 아까 말씀드린 것처럼 전통적인 주식 시장의 수요가 이 주식 토큰으로 어떻게 이동할 것인가라는 관점에서 바라볼 문제가 아니고 답변을 주신 것처럼 이 코인 자체가 갖는 여러 가지 강점들이 많기 때문에 코인에 대한 수요가 늘어날 수밖에 없고 그럼 코인을 보유하고 있을 때그 코인을 어떻게 활용해서 수익을 높일 것인가라는 문제를 당연히 고민하게 될 테고요. 그런 측면에서 코인으로 된 주식이 그 수요를 가져갈 수 있는 그런 부분에 대한 어, 답변이 상당히 인상이 깊었습니다. 예, 저희가 시간이 다 되어가지고요. 어, 마지막으로 어, 커멘트 드리고 마무리하도록 하겠습니다. 생각해 보시면은 저희가 그 종이 형태로 된 그런 증권이 거래되던 시기가 불과 한 20년 전이라고 보여지는데요. 그 이후에 지금 보시면 대부분의 거래가 전자증권 형태로 이루어지고 있습니다. 이 코인이라는 게 미래에 이 다양한 상당히 강점을 갖는 이 코인이 어, 가까운 미래에 이 주식 거래의 한 가지 형태로 이루어질 거라는 그런 예측은 그렇게 무리하다고 생각되지 않거든요. 그래서 그런 의미에서 오늘 패널 토론 이 전문가 분들께서 제공해 주신 여러 가지 인사이트가 어, 이러한 어떤 전체적인 트렌드를 파악하시는데 조금이나마 도움이 되었기를 바랍니다. Yeah. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you for sharing your insights today. Yeah. 네, 여기서 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 네, 수고해주신 저장님 그리고 모든 패널 분들님 진심으로 감사합니다.